This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest on the podcast today is joining me remotely from uh, Weaverville, North Carolina, Mike Karnowski of Zebulon Artisan and Ales. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Hey, Jamie. Glad to be here. Uh, uh, I guess it was 2019 uh, when I was out there and we filmed some uh, classes with some brewers for our online education platform. Um with some brewers in the Asheville area did a fantastic course with Mike and you should definitely check out uh, the uh, the full length video classes that come with the all access subscriptions for craft beer and brewing and watch him make uh, a historical recipe out of that we're going to talk about similar kinds of stuff on the podcast today recreating uh, historical recipes um, the challenge of uh, figuring out ingredients substitutions uh, adjusting recipes for currently available ingredients uh, thinking about different ways that uh, historical brewers made made these beers and figuring out how to do them with modern day technology and ingredients um and it's a subject we haven't really talked about on the podcast before so i'm excited to do it thanks for uh, for talking with me about this mike how many years ago was 2019 i know five at least seven years ago right <laughs> in, oh. in covid years or in, in years years uh, <sighs> It feels like so long ago. I wish we were. I was there drinking a beer with you now and uh, drinking one of your mild, uh, low ABV uh, beers in the tap room. Unfortunately, we have to do this uh, digitally and remotely. I would argue that that this is not the year for low alcohol beers. <laughs> <laughs> as you much as it. that's my whole shtick, uh, you know, it's almost like a hard liquor year. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a very good point there. So we're going to talk about brewing historical style beers, but first, nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with GND Chillers. Innovative modular designs and no proprietary parts propel GND ahead as the premier choice for your glycol chilling needs. Breweries you recognize like Russian River and Kasi, Jack's Abbey, Samuel Adams, and a bunch more brewers you've heard on this very podcast all trust GND to chill the beer you love. Call GND Chillers to discuss your project today or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by RAR North Star Pills, a new base malt to set your compass by. RAR North Star Pills is crafted for brewers looking for a domestic Pilsner malt with low color and low modification. North Star Pills carries overtones of honey and sweet bread, supported by flavors and aromas of hay and nutty character. Suitable for any beer style, but particularly craft brewed versions of classic lagers. Let RAR North Star Pills guide your craft by visiting bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact Contact them at 1-800-374-2739. So, Mike, uh, give me the the Karnowski brewing history in a nutshell. Um, you know, how what would what path did your brewing history take to to lead you now here uh, with Zebulon, a small, highly focused um, artisanal brewer in Weaverville, North Carolina, just outside of Asheville? Well. It's 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 really a, a lifetime almost. I mean, I grew up uh, where we had uh, grapevines in our backyard, and my dad made wine. So even being like 11, 12 years old, you know, he had us out there smashing the grapes, and there were bubbling carboys around me and trips to the local wine supply store. And so years later... Well, not too many years later, uh, I was I had joined the army and was in uh, Seattle, Washington, and and walked by a homebrew shop, and I was like, "Hey, let let's make some beer," you know, and so I mean, I started homebrewing in uh, 1986, and then uh, my wife and I met in New York City, and uh, moved to New Orleans and opened up a homebrew supply store down there called Brouhaha that we had for 13 years. So that's where I kind of cut my teeth as far as as learning. I mean, it, it doesn't sound like it would be a great craft brewing uh, education, but it really was every, you know, I was brewing twice a week for 13 years. So every single malt that was available, I was 
experimenting with every hop, every single yeast strain. So by the time I got out of the homebrew shop, I really had this great palette of, of, of flavors. And I really knew what I was doing as far as ingredient wise and, uh, had, had kind of dialed in all the classic styles that, you know, really don't matter anymore. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, honestly, you know, how how many of the BJCP styles are actually brewed commercially by brewers? It's almost, you know, it's almost nostalgic to think of an amber ale. You know, when was the last time you saw an amber ale in a, in a pub? It's just it, a lot of these styles have just disappeared. You're or, killing me, Mike. We our, our next issue after our best in beer issue is all about those classic styles: amber, golden, brown, red. Those are colors. Uh, those aren't com styles. commercial suicide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like to think that we're small enough where we could do those styles if we wanted to. But honestly, I'm just I'm not that interested in beers that are named after the the colors that they are i'm i'm, I'm a tra i've become a traditionalist you know i'm more interested in going backwards as, as i see what what craft beer is kind of turning into i i I'm, I'm turning around and running back to the 1800s where i understand what things like stouts and porters and pale ales although what they were back then is nothing like uh they are today for sure Let's definitely talk about that. But first, you also, um, uh, you know, worked for a brewery now uh, before launching Zebulon. You you worked commercially as a brewer also, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I kind of lost track after the uh, uh, the homebrew shop. Uh, so after Hurricane Katrina, we decided to abandon the the homebrew shop uh, plan and to to get out of Dodge within a couple of years. So I spent a couple of years as the head distiller at a rum distillery down there. And that was kind of fun, but I mean, honestly, walking around with snifter glasses of barrel aged liquor is just not a good <laughs> lifestyle choice. I found out, <laughs> yeah. you know, my liver is like, no, 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 we can't have this. Um, so we moved up to Asheville, um, around 2007 and uh you know i was assuming it would be you know there's six or seven breweries here it should be pretty easy to get a job and um it's just kind of amazing to see that there were only six breweries in Asheville, you know 12 years ago and now there's something like 38 wow um so it was just a, it was a very different world back then so i got a i got a job at uh green man brewery which is one of the old school classic Asheville breweries, one of the first three or four that were here. And uh, yeah, I was assistant brewer there for um, seven years. Um, you know, at the end, I became a, a specialty brewer focusing on uh, Asheville's first sour beer program um, that became fairly well known. We, we did a lot of uh, one-off small batch. I mean, back then... It, it's kind of a funny story. When I when I moved up from New Orleans, the rum distillery was like, take a whole barrel of rum with you. And I was like, I do not need <laughs> 53 gallons of 140 proof rum in my basement, but I will take an empty barrel. So I took, I, I brought an empty barrel, uh, rum barrel uh, up to New Orleans, uh, up to Asheville with me. And uh, at Green Man, we started just putting beer into that. So we just put our house porter or our house stout in this rum barrel. And that was literally Asheville's first barrel program. There was, there was nobody else in town doing any whiskey or rum barrel aging at all at that point. And so we, we, we did this run of rum barrel aged beers. And after like three uses, it, it just kind of lost its flavor, right. of course. And so I decided, let me just turn this into a sour barrel. And so I had been doing a lot of experimenting at home, uh, making sour beer. I've, I, you know, I've been making sour beer for, for 20 years at that point. Um, at home, you know, just, just goofing on it, trying to understand Lambic and, and, and the different uh, thing. It was so different, though, in those days. Nowadays, you can just go to any yeast company, and they're going to have sour beer blends and... Uh, you know, you can buy different lactose and pedios and, 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 and these different uh, bugs. But 
back in those days, I was having to special order from Y East, you know, Pediococcus and, uh, and and Lacto and all these different strains. And it was very complicated. I mean, it was a long lead time and then they'd send you this thing. You'd have to make starters. And, and I was doing a lot of experimenting with dregs, of course, like, like sure. most sour beer brewers uh, did. And so I had a good culture going at my house of a blend of dregs and stuff that I've collected. And I just took those to work and pitched them into this rum barrel and started Asheville's first sour program at that point. Um, and we're just, it was literally one single barrel full of my homebrew cultures. And the first three or four beers, sour beers out of Asheville f were from that one barrel. And we still own that barrel. It's still uh, at, at Zebulon now. And it's kind of our magic barrel. Um, I mean, it's not a great barrel, honestly, for, for sour beers because the, uh, the whiskey barrel staves are so much thinner than mm -hmm. a wine wine barrel so it lets a lot of oxygen through so it, it can get a little acetic but it's got a lot of character and we'll, we'll often blend you know 10 percent, 5 percent of that in with a sour uh, blend just to get some complexity but it's just more just to have it around you know it's got some good history and it makes a good story uh, the good story counts for a lot yeah. so what drove you to uh to break out on your own and launch zebulon well, you know, it's that seven year itch, you know, um, I had been there seven years and, uh, just uh, honestly, I mean, after having the homebrew supply shop for 13 years, I really didn't have a desire to work for myself again. The, uh, the two, uh, the two most overrated things in life are like natural childbirth and <laughs> owning your own business. <laughs> It, it it looks good from the outside, but you know, once you get your own business going, it's so much work and so much stress and, and mental anguish um, going. Especially like Zebulon, it's just me and my wife. There's nobody else, so everything's on uh, mine and my wife's shoulders, and it's a lot. I, I, there's something to be said for working for somebody else and just being able to focus all your effort on the beer itself you know what do you i'm the brewer i make the beer but i'm also you know doing the taxes i'm doing the you know the t-shirts the and the uh and just it's just, it's just a lot more right there's something right. to be said for just picking up your paycheck on friday but there's also something to be said for having full creative control and that's what I got with Zebulon. Is it, 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 if nothing else, it's just a passion project that is a creative outlet for me to just explore uh, different uh, pathways in beer that I'm interested in. And the beauty is it's so tiny that I can totally get away with that. You know, if, if once you get above a certain level and you got a bunch of employees, you you have to kind of sacrifice that in order to make sure everybody gets paid. And so all of a sudden you're like, all right, how many hazies do we have to do? Blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> and I understand that. I mean, I'm not I'm not shitting on big breweries. There's something sure. noble about having multiple employees and paying them and letting them live off of you know your creation, but. I am just not like that. I am stripped down, keep the cost low, focus on being creative and making interesting beers that other people aren't making and just hope that you can make a living off of it, which so far we've been uh, been able to do. Yeah. And, you know, so there are no, it is just you and your wife. There are no other employees. You all keep incredibly limited tap room hours. I think you're open, what, like two days a week, Fridays and Saturdays for a few hours each day. Yeah, Fridays and Saturdays, uh, technically one to six. Sometimes it runs later, you know, seven thirty or so. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, initially the plan was not to have a tap room at all. You know, the dream was, as somebody antisocial like myself, just like black out the windows like Elvis, <laughs> put aluminum right. foil up, and just be in there mysteriously making beer as a production brewery and selling it out in the world. And my wife, you know, she's the voice of reason. She's like, you know, people are going to want to come in here. And I was like, oh, all right. How about we just open on weekends? 
<laughs> and it's I mean, it would be silly for us not to. It, it's it's at least 50, 60 percent of all of our business is those 10, 12 hours a week. But there, there is something I think that's fascinating and interesting about in order to kind of stay focused on the creative vision that you have, you have made sure that the scale of the business can support that kind of risk taking and you're, you have a bitten off more you can chew. You know, so many brewers that I, I talk to even, you know, off the record or privately look back at some of the decisions that they've made in order to grow the brewery and they've grown because that growth is this it's the smart capitalist thing to do it's what everyone tells them is this measure of success um that if you can grow you should grow and then there's that question of well i've i've made this investment and now i need to pay it off and i need to pay it off by growing a little bit and then now in order to grow that i need to invest a little bit more in this and now that i've made this other investment now i need to grow a little bit more and you you know you, as a brewer you end up chasing your tail a lot of the time and just growing for growth stake in order to you know keep up with the debt payments that you've now taken out um, and so it really is a kind of refreshing and different strategy that you're taking here to deliberately keep the investment low, keep that overhead low, stay fluid, stay flexible, and be able to kind of call your own shots. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's true. I'm not sure I would recommend it necessarily <laughs> as a business strategy. I mean, it depends what kind of brewer you are. Right. Um yeah, everything you were saying about growth and, and uh, just just unending growth and investment, it's just like nails on the chalkboard for me. I, I as is not, I'm not that kind of person. I, 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 I want to tell people don't follow what I'm saying because I am a bad businessman. I do not. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I really, I'm able to carve out a living doing what I'm doing with this kind of crazy little scheme, but I'm not sure it'll work other places. Um, and I'm not sure it'll work with certain types of brewers um, or beer styles. Um, but, but fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Let's, um, let's shift gears and start talking about, uh, some of the, uh, historical, uh, focused brewing and, uh, you know, recreational type of brewing that you've been, that you play with and that you've enjoyed and that you've kind of focused on in your retreat from modernity. Um, you know, <laughs> as you alluded to before, before we do that, five star chemicals and supply is your leading provider of cleaning, sanitizing, and adjunct chemicals for breweries throughout North America. America and internationally. All products have been formulated with safety, equipment, material, and quality in mind. Interested in trying their products? Contact support at fivestarchemicals.com to inquire about a free craft brew sample pack and only pay the shipping. Cheers to beer. Also, Yakima Valley Hops is your hop source, whether you're brewing five gallons or five barrels. Get all the hops you want when you want them. They source the highest quality hops from the Yakima Valley and premium growing regions around the world so that you have access to the largest hop portfolio possible, even hard to find varieties like Citra, Nelson Sauvin, and Galaxy. Homebrewers, visit yakimavalleyhops.com and wholesale accounts. Find them at spothops.com. So, Let's talk a little bit about uh, this turn towards historical brewing that you've made with Zebulon. Uh, what started sparking your interest in going back to these uh, recipes from the 1800s and trying to make beer like brewers did way back in the day? Well, I, I think it all needs to be um, attributed to to Ron Pattinson's work. Um, sure. The beer historian. If if anybody doesn't know about Ron, you should check out his blog, uh, Shut Up About Barclay Perkins. dot com. Barclay Perkins is used to be the Anheuser Busch of the world. It was the biggest brewery um, in the entire world, and now nobody remembers it. And he he's he, he you know history. It's part my love for history and part for my love for beer. Uh, coming together. And Ron is the same way. Ron spends his life in uh, the basements of breweries and libraries looking at old brewers' logs and photographing them and translating them into uh, modern terms, you know, from hogsheads and things like that. Um, and I've been following his work for, for a long time, even, you know, back when I worked at Green Man, we brought Ron into town from Amsterdam and uh, did a 
I think we did the the history of English mild, like 1750 to 1970. And, uh, and Ron's just, he, you know, his, his work is all about documenting these, uh, these old beer recipes from the old brewer's logs, but his work really doesn't come to fruition until brewers actually make these beers and bring them back to life. Right. Otherwise it's just very academic. Theoretical, right. And so uh, I, th I think Ron really appreciates brewers who, um, who, who take it upon themselves to bring these beers uh, to life. And uh, so what we would do is we'd bring Ron in and uh, we'd brew up all these historical beers. His, uh, like the first time it was just milds. And, and when you get into milds and start looking at the history, they are nothing like what we think of as milds or what the BJCP thinks as milds. Back in the day, mild just meant unaged. So in a brewery, you might make the same beer and one of them would head to barrels that would be have, you know, whether they knew it or not, have Britannomyces in them. And those would sit there for six or eight months, 12 months. And the other stuff would just be sent out. And the stuff that was just sent out was just called mild. So you would have, you know, mild stouts, you would have mild bitters, you would have mild ales. And um, some of them were gigantic, you know, o over 1100, uh, you know, 27 Plato beers, just just monster pale, you know, so 100 percent pale malt. 120, 160, 180 IBUs of Goldings <laughs> in these things. Yeah. I mean, that does not pigeonhole nicely into any BJCP mild ale category. And so, I mean, that's how they start off. They just start off as fresh, huge beers. I mean, they, they had second running beers and table beers and that. Um, but it's fun to start off a lecture, you know, where you just hand somebody, which is basically a fresh barley wine, and be like, this is mild ale. And let's <laughs> let's follow the, the evolution of what happens to it over centuries of world wars, taxation, public uh, palates. And, and, and by the end, you know, you go from this thing that was just completely different to at the end, you know, in 1950, 1960, it's a 2.8, 3.2% ABV beer you know, just absolutely nothing connected to it from, from what it started as. And to me, that's, that's really fascinating. Uh, but it's even better when you're pairing it with actual recreations of these beers. Right, people, when you can actually taste it and not just talk about it. People love it. And um, so we've been keeping that going. I mean, we started that probably seven, eight, nine years ago and then have been bringing Ron back to town. And we've done multiple lectures on uh, – you know, the history of Porter, lost and forgotten beer styles. And uh, we were planning this year, if it wasn't for COVID, this was going to be the the mother of all tasting lectures. It's going to be the entire history of IPA, 1750 to 2021 <laughs> ta tag team lecture with uh, Ron Pattinson, Mitch Steele. Oh. <gasps> So, so Ron yeah, will take us yeah. from like 1750 to 1950 England, and then they'll tag team out, and Mitch will come in and take us from Liberty Ale, you know, 1970s West Coast, up to God knows what IPA is going to be in 2021. <laughs> and so I just figured that would be a hilarious journey, you know. And, yeah, yeah. and we've been trying to figure out how – I don't think we can do it this year. I think we're hoping to do it next year. And uh, maybe even you know put together a a, a, a fun six pack of of uh, IPAs you know thirty forty years a piece and so so people at home like like we're doing now can can watch it online right. as opposed to having to be here and I think people would really get that if we could send out a six pack of the history of IPA and then people could watch a Zoom meeting or whatever and then drink it at home you know have sure. the little flashing number like they did with uh, <laughs> with that John Waters movie where you had to scratch and sniff. I, I forget that. But uh, yeah, so so Ron and Ron and I are very close as far as he is my mentor as far as 
uh, beer recipes go. Every anything I do historical comes from his work. So I always love to give him a shout out. He, his books are they're just a, a perfect example of OCD focused in a great way where he you know he's just obsessed about this stuff and sometimes somebody's obsession can be your gain you know you sure sure and that's kind of what when what i'm doing is at, at zebulon i'm obsessing about things and people can come in and and sample my obsessions um and hopefully they're they're interesting and delicious what i what i love about beer right now you know is that it has grown large enough and there is enough interest for you know to support these generally fun weird small commercial uh, ideas um you know but allow brewers with visions around these kinds of things and you know the vision of innovation is not just how do i put more fruit in it or how do i you know make my finishing gravity uh even higher and higher and higher you know i love that we now have a process of innovation within craft beers even you know even in north america that is how do we make better loggers? How do we, you know, figure out how to, um, Im you know, improve our technical processes around uh, making, you know, very historical styles of beer? How do we go back, you know, a century ago and re, you know, consider the way the beer used to be, so we have a broader understanding about how we got here, where we are now. All of these are really interesting and valuable and uh, useful uh, kind of approaches to beer that that help us, um, you know, in this kind of modern context, understand it in a you know a better kind of way. And so I love that you're doing that. That's uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you started facing because now as you're taking some of the uh, academic work that Ron has done, digging up old recipes, looking, you know, trying to understand what brewers meant when they said certain things on recipes and what that actually could have been. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a translation and a little bit of a, you know, kind of a, you know, historian work involved in, in figuring out just what they were, what they meant when they said certain things. Um, talk to me a little bit about some of those early you know, experiences trying to take these historical recipes um, and then make them yourself? Well, obviously, I don't have anything to compare them to. <laughs> so, right. you know, th these are recipes from brewers who have long been in the grave. Um, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch to to say that the the basic ingredients that we use today are not that far from what they would have been in 1850 1880 ron's got alpha acid uh analysis of east ken goldings from like 1900 that are like 7.4 hmm. so so a lot of people are like oh the, the the hops back then were weak or they're not you know and, and he's got done all the work on you know, the, the storage of them, you know, cold storage, and they would wrap them in tightly in fabric and keep them as cold as they could. So I don't really think that the hops, I mean, you're seeing insane hop levels in these beers. We're seeing 170, 180 IBUs on some of these. And, and of course, the, the, the typical brewer is going to be like, well, that can't be right. But they, they, they don't understand that these beers were aged often for a year before being released. And my experience with brewing these beers, every year we do a, an East India, IP, uh, East India Pale Ale reproduction, recreation, and it's just 100% Maris Otter and 170 IBUs of East Kent Goldings. But after a year in the barrel with Brett, it softens up so nicely. I mean, you still get the mouth coating resin, which is is so fun about these beers. But they're not harsh. They're not they're not bitter or coarse or anything like that. So the the brewers back then knew what they were doing. I mean, you don't want to discount the knowledge that that past brewers had. They might not have even in the eighteen hundreds. Obviously, they didn't have single yeast culture. I mean, that didn't come around until almost 1900 with Pasteur and, and Carlsbergensis and all that. Right. So they were they were just repitching, you know, scraping the yeast off the top and putting in the next one. But it's not like they were just savages who didn't understand what they were doing. They knew how to make things work. 
even if they didn't actually have the microscopes to see what was going on, they had hundreds of years of experience to teach them how to do these things. Have there been any specific ingredients that you haven't found modern corollaries for that you've then had to kind of you know develop or figure out? I know, I know that, uh, you know, and I'm just asking a leading question because I kind of know the answer. Uh, I just want right, you to hear you talk about it. Yeah, um, when we were doing the uh, – the, the evolution of English Porter for, for Ron's last visit, you know, when you get back to 1750, beers are very different. You know, right. 1850, they're very modern. You can totally look at it and be like, yeah, that's a Porter, you know, 5% black malt, 5% brown malt, 90% pale malt. You know, it's going to make a good beer. But you get back to the 1750s and things are a little more sketchy as far as malting goes. They were still, you know, drying over fires and, uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, they're experimenting with with doing it over coke uh, and, and different types of wood. It's not really sure whether they enjoyed the smoke flavor or not. It might be a little telling that that after they dis discovered how to do pale malt, that smoked brown malt came back into favor. So I tend to think that maybe people liked a little hint of smoke in their beer. Mm -hmm. We tend, you know, it, it's easy to be like, oh, all beer in the past was sour and smoky, uh, i.e. it was gross. But I, I think, again, the brewers knew what they were doing. They knew how to make a, uh, a, a delicious beer. And although tastes are different, of course, but I don't think anything would be unrecognizable to us as birth. So when we were making this... It could also be that kind of condition where the smell of smoke was a much more common occurrence in daily life, given that it's heating um, and, uh, right. and, and providing interior lighting. Um, you know, and so, you know, as with everything, as you grow familiar with something, you also may notice it a little bit less and it just becomes a normal part of the environment. Um, you know, we tend to today in, in today's you know, day and age with uh, electricity and gas, um, you know, we don't smell smoke becomes its own kind of very specific, separate, um, you know, kind of aroma. But uh, it would have been very common in day to day life at that point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so when we were doing uh, this uh, evolution of English Porter with Ron, the, the, this lecture tasting, I wanted to try to make a traditional 1750s uh, Porter, which was brewed with 100% diastatic brown malt. So diastatic uh, for, for the non-brewers out there means that it, it's got enough enzymes where when you mix it with hot water, warm water, it will convert the starches into sugars. Modern brown malt is not diastatic at all. It's got zero diastatic power. If you mix it in with, with water, you're just going to get an unfermentable uh, sugar water, which we tried. We, uh, we actually did a, a, a mash of 100% modern uh, brown malt. And we got a nice, you know, we got good efficiency out of it. We got like a 1065 OG, and then we pitched some yeast. And like a month later, is like 1062. <laughs> it hadn't moved at all. And so it's, it's just, it's not fermentable sugars. But back then, it was a type of pale malt that would still convert itself while giving a dark enough color to make a beer that was brownish black. And back then, you know, it was still considered brown beer. The the black colored porter was not really, you know, that that I think that's more of a late 1850s type thing. Once they, you know, started using black malt, they they started dialing in the color. But anything that was even like mahogany brown, mahogany amber to brownish color would have been considered okay for a porter. Um, so we we uh, we got a local malting company, Epiphany Malt, out of Raleigh to do this malt for us. And so the, the trick really was to be able to get it dark enough where you get a, an, enough color to make it brown without deactivating the enzymes. And that becomes really tricky, you know, and the, 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 the trick is with nowadays we have uh, roller uh, uh, caramel, yeah, you know, to make caramel drums. malt or yeah, drums. 
And so everything becomes very uniform. And so if you're going to heat up in a drum malt to get to the, the color that you want, which is like 60 love a bond overall, you're going to deactivate all the enzymes. There's no way, you know, you're basically making 60 love crystal malt. And so the, the, what we learned was back in the 1750s, they did things on a large flat tray um, where there'd be high heat underneath and you'd layer the malt on at about like two or three inches, um, maybe maybe around inch and a half, two inches deep. And, and what would happen is the top and the bottom would get kind of charred, but the inside would be protected and would still be pale and would keep the enzymes intact. And so we did a lot of experimenting and, and, and we made it work um, where – you know when you when you stir up the grain after doing this this charring this smoking it really looks as if you had mixed a porter grist together in a in a in a bag or, or whatever hmm. it, it you you pick up a handful and it's like 10% charred malt 20% amberish caramelized kind of malt and then 70% light colored pale malt and as long as we could get it to convert, that was what we were doing. We're trying to find as high as we could go where it would still convert. And uh, we got this malt, and uh, the smoke was fairly light on it because the research showed that they would, uh, in England, they would use stuff called hornbeam, or what uh, we call it in America is like ironwood. It's what we make often handles of shovels and tools out of because it's, it's very dense. And when it burns, it doesn't create a lot of smoke. So, I mean, again, here we see these maltsters and brewers knowing they have to dry the wood with smoke, but they don't want – they want the minimal amount of smoke flavor. So they're choosing woods hmm. that have the least amount of smoke character in it. So, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting beer. I, I, it's one of those ones that I don't think would be accepted – as a porter in modern life. I mean, when you smell this, I mean, it's got the Brett character because it's been aged in a barrel. It's smoky. And Brett and smoke, that's that's a pretty challenging character. Yeah. Especially you imagine people, you know, do, you know, pounding pints of this. It's fine in a little, <laughs> in a little you know, right, five ounce right. snifter. You want a oh, smoky, bready beer. But that this was what 80% of the people were drinking was this smoky, funky thing. It was one of those ones where we just had to chalk it up to uh, different palettes over the centuries that it's like, this is what I guess people were into. I don't know. It's very yeah. fun though. Let's um, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, historical iterations of Imperial Stouts because I know you've definitely played in that territory and have some thoughts on, uh, on that. Before we do that, ABS Commercial is excited to be a part of today's podcast. ABS is a full brewery outfitter offering brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and small parts. ABS wanted to do something fun for the craft beer industry, so they're giving away an ABS Keg Viking Keg Washer live on December 5th, which also happens to be National Repeal Day. To enter, go to www.abs-commercial.com, click on Keg Viking page, and fill out the contest form for your chance to win. Also, if you enjoy this podcast and want to support our mission to bring you valuable insights from the world's best brewing minds, Craft Beer and Brewing's all-access subscriptions are the best way to do it. Get a year of the print and digital editions of the magazine, plus access to our library of video courses, including one for Mike Karnowski right here, a special deep dive email, and more. Go to beerandbrewing.com and click on the subscribe button to join now. So Imperial Stout is a you know a particular focus for you, Mike, and I know it's, you know you've made quite a few over the years, and you've taken a few different strategies on how to do that. Um, talk to me a little bit about that historical evolution of uh, of Imperial Stout from the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s uh, to today. I think that Imperial Stouts probably haven't evolved that much compared to other styles. Um, other than hopping levels, I mean the pastry stout. You know, I'm not sure I want to want to go into that, but <laughs> yeah, I think we I all mean, know your opinions on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, my opinion is if that's what people want, 
then brewers should give them what they want. Um, I, I find them just just so cloyingly sweet. Right. And, and it's just my personal preference. I don't have a sweet tooth. I, I like bitter. I like dryness in my beers. And most brewers that, that I know, too, we, we just aren't into sweet things. Sure. It, um, so, I mean, your typical 1850s Russian Imperial Stout is what, what I make – Almost all the time. If I'm making a Russian Imperial Stout, it's going to be one with about 15% brown malt in it, and then three to five percent black malt, and the uh, the rest pale uh, marisada. You know, it, it's it's not complicated, um, but it, it makes a very drinkable, nicely complex coffee chocolate flavor from the brown malt and the little bit of of black malt. The difference is that the IBUs are often very high. I mean, uh, in 1850, your your typical Russian Imperial would be, you know, 100, 120, 140 IBUs. And to me, I like that. I like, especially after six months of aging, 12 months of aging, those hops just really help dry out the beer almost dangerously into a pintable product you know the, the the trouble with with modern imperial styles for me is just that that sweetness stops you from wanting to have another drink you know if you imagine you pour a full 16 ounce pint of you know some lactose vanilla thing i'm mean, not saying anything bad about it but you're going to have a hard time plowing your way through a 16 ounce pint of that because every sip is just going to become cloying and coating your mouth as opposed to these early Russian imperial stouts where you take a sip, you get a big burst of chocolate and coffee and then boom, it slices the hops, just slice it down and leave you with a crisp palate that make you want another sip. And you find yourself being like, this is so drinkable. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Do people want drinkable Imperial Stouts? I don't know. <laughs> sure, sure. I don't know. I mean, do you, it can be dangerous for sure. Maybe you want just a small pour of something that's just super gooey and and sweet. And I don't know. I, I really don't feel like I, I sh I, I'm trying not to judge palates or judge uh, people that satisfy those palates because it's just, it yeah. is what it is. It's right. always right. changing. Now with that kind of, kind of uh, black malt component, you know, it has, that has fallen out of favor as of late, you know, with uh, brewers of Imperial stouts, Russian Imperial stouts, because it tends to and can produce a bit of astringency, you know, and that kind of, you know, sharp kind of, you know, sharpie uh, note in the beer. Um, I don't believe that at all. You don't believe that at all? No. I, th I think if you use a quality black malt, you can easily go up to 10 10 percent and have no astringency and no ashy quality it's a it's all about a quality black malt you know i'm not going to call out bur uh maltsters that i wouldn't recommend but i think if you stick to a quality english black malt i use thomas fawcett hubert a uh, lot of good English black malts out there. You're not going to get any kind of harsh quality in that. I, don't, I really, I think that's a homebrew myth where people start, you know, trying to like, oh, I, I'm going to just, you know, cap my mash with some black malt so I'll get the color, but I don't want any flavor. I think, I think that's a mistake. I think black malt is a beautiful malt, and I've actually got a keg of a hundred percent black malt. Uh, that I keep around the brewery for when Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath dies. And, uh, <laughs> I'm using it as an ink so I can color every beer at the brewery black overnight. <laughs> hashtag, hashtag black for Tony. Come on, brewers. Help me out. Get on board. Um, maybe that's... maybe for, for Willie Nelson, too. Who knows? Uh, I, I appreciate your patience and, and preparation for that kind of thing. That's a, you got to be ready. That's a level, getting old. Of, a level of dedication that I don't often see in brewers. Um, are there any other interesting, uh, you know, challenges that you faced in recreating um, 
uh, some of these historical recipes uh, or ingredients or, you know, even things that you've learned about brewing um, specifically from some of the later projects that you've brewed out of, out of uh, some of these Ron partnerships? I think the, I think, I think the, the main thing that people are going to run into when they start looking at these recipes is the uh, inverts sugar syrups. You, you see in them almost in every single recipe, especially once you get into the 1900s, you know, just be like, oh, yes, you've got, you've got to throw in three pounds of number three invert or number two invert or number one invert. And you just can't buy those anymore. I mean, if you were, if you lived in England, maybe you could get them. There's a company uh, called Ragus, which is sugar backwards, and uh, they make they make the traditional one, two, and three invert syrups. But they won't sell them for export. I try, I looked into getting a little side business of uh, of getting in drums of this invert syrup and and packaging it up for home brewers. And they won't do it because it just has such a short shelf life. Um, so the only thing left is to either make it yourself. And there, there's instructions out there. Uh, if, uh, Kristen England, who is a, a, a co-author with a lot of Ron's uh, books, uh, ha has something online about how to make your own. It's not complicated. You just take like some nice raw, you know, sugar in the raw. Uh, sugar, put it into a pot with a little pinch of uh, citric acid, and then uh, just just slowly cook it. I mean, it takes a long time, but it's a fun, like Sunday afternoon type project where you just want to like get stoned and and make some some home brewing ingredients. You uh, you know, it sounds takes, like my typical you know, Sunday. You know, oh, it's great. You know, and you just you put this on the on the burner real low, and you put ten pounds of sugar in there, and you cook it and after two hours, it's invert sugar number one. After four hours, it's invert sugar number two. And after six hours, it's invert number three. And they're all different colors. And you just, you know, as you go through, you just keep pouring it off into mason jars. And then you've got this uh, recreation of this impossible to find ingredient. Whether or not, you know, I, the, the trouble with sugars is. In, in in the 1900s, there's something like 160 types of sugars available to English brewers. And they all had just like initial names, CDM, you know, or B, BL or something. And, and Ron has no idea what any of these mean. <laughs> yeah. and, and nobody nobody really does. So, you know, he's like, I've just decided to put invert number two in here instead. And so... I don't think there's any right or wrong flavors. I mean, it, it, I, I really feel that you can use these Belgian candy syrups um, in place of the invert syrups. You know, like I would use probably a D90 for a, 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 a number two invert and maybe the D180 for a number three invert and the D45 for a, 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 a number one invert. And I don't think anybody could tell you that that's wrong because there's so many different sugar syrups in use where, you know, it's it's all a guess at this point. So if you don't feel like making your own syrups, just feel free to, to sub in some of these uh, Belgian candy syrups. It's still going to be delicious. And it, there, it's such a, a flavor contribution, too. I mean, you get these dark fruit characters from the from the from the number three invert. Yeah, just like plums and raisins and it, it adds a layer of complexity you just don't get with just crystal malt and especially with english milds that was the that was the flavor of english mild is pale malt and uh number three invert syrup that that's it made it dark amber ruby colored but not roasty or or anything it just had this dark fruit character from the syrup so that's a fun, you know, if you want to get into old school English brewing, just take a day off, cook up 10 pounds of different invert syrups, and then, uh, and then just, you know, make some beer with it. And you, and it's a, it's a fun flavor that's kind of disappeared from modern, modern palates. Sure. Are there any particular beers that you've recreated that um, really stand out for you as 
beers that you love to keep bringing back because you love to drink them, things that, uh, you know, more of the brewing world should continue to pay attention to? Well, we made this one mild ale that was in the darkest, darkest days of uh, World War One, And the original gravity was 1011, 1. 1.011. That was the original gravity. And it... it, it was right around 1% ABV. And it was it was a, a fun beer to make. I mean, it's like four pounds of malt for, for 15 gallons. Yeah. It, was, it was just ridiculous. And the flavor was kind of like a beer-flavored La Croix, you know, hmm. the, the seltzer. Right. It was almost like a beer-flavored seltzer. But, I mean, delicious still. I mean, it was just... But it was not, it was just flirting with being beer or not. And on one hand, it's, it's, you know, you want to drink it because you're like, people at one point, this is what they had to drink. This was it. It was a sad time. Also, it's just kind of fun to flirt with how low can we go with ABV. Uh, a lot of brewers that I talked to were all really interested in low alcohol, non-alcoholic beer that still tastes great. You know, it, 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 being a brewer, you're just surrounded by beer all the time. And it can get sometimes sure, sure. A, as a lifestyle, it can become a little problematic. And what a lot of us are really interested in is super low alcohol beer, stuff that we can, you know, just – in, a, in an afternoon of mowing the yard and playing guitar and uh, hanging out with friends, we can drink five, six pints of and still be good to drive, you know, and, and you get that by getting up sub 2%, you know? Yeah. And so this was a really interesting lowering of the bar. Like, well, this is 1% alcohol and it's, tastes pretty good it tastes like iced tea hmm. unsweetened iced tea but you could you know you're like all right let me take it up a little bit let me take it up to two percent you know and it's fun just flirting around with that one to two percent area of beer because nobody's really playing around with that and but i think you can make really delicious quaffable beer that's two percent alcohol I just don't think you can sell it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I think we sure, were selling sure. those 1% pints for like 250 a 20 ounce pour, but and people were enjoying it as a novelty historical right, right. sort of thing, but I just I mean, let's be honest, you're not going to be able to sell that, I don't think. I think I think there's a non-alcoholic beer segment that you can sell to if you can get it down to 0 or 0.5. But that weird 1%, 2%, right. it's like no man's land. But I think a lot of brewers are interested in that. And I think there's, there's definitely progress to be made. I think small amounts of brown malt in something like, like half a pound to a pound in 15 gallons adds a depth of character to these low alcohol beers. That's If anybody wants to play around with that, a little bit of brown malt, I think, is a good way to go. Yeah. Um, let's zoom out for a little bit and talk about style in a broader sense. Obviously, you are, you know, following styles and the evolution of styles and are um, very aware and attuned to the ways that styles shift over time. In our modern era of craft beer, informed by things like GABF style guides and BJCP style guides, we have ascribed to styles uh, some sense of permanence uh, that they may not have had in generations of the past. Uh, and so in a way, you know, this kind of taxonomy that we have created around these things, um, you know, can it has its own impact on creativity and movement of the market and everything else as people have some expectation for it. Talk to me from your perspective. Um, you know, you mentioned mild earlier being completely uh, out of left field compared to what we consider it now. Um, but when you personally consider styles and how we use language around style, 
to describe beer. Um, talk to me about that kind of nuance that you try to use in, in explaining these things and how you understand that entire concept of style. Well, I, I think it might be a uniquely American phenomenon that we want to be able to pigeonhole things to enable to help us understand them. But it, it doesn't exist in other countries, as far as I know. I mean, you go to Belgium and ask them what a trapel is, and they'll be like, whatever the brewery says it is. You know, well, and what, you know, be like, oh, but the, the BJCP says it's got to be this color. And they'd, they'll just look at you with a weird look because they don't understand styles li like that. And, uh, English too, English beers. I mean, I just got a new Ron Pattinson book called uh, IPA in World War Two. I mean, this is how, how geeky it gets. Um, but a lot of these beers, you know, they're like 1034 OG and 22 IBUs and a quarter ounce of dry hops. You're like, well, this is this is not an IPA, but it was fine in 19. 40, 47, you know, the English drinkers thought it was fine to call it an IPA. So what are we, you know, 80 years later, I'm supposed to look back on them and be like, you fools, how could you not know that's not an IPA? You know, it's looking back, you know, conversely, with if they were looking at what we are labeling IPA today, oh, filled with sugar and fruit, that, you know, they might also <laughs> look at it with the same kind of disdain. You know, why? How can you call that IPA? But having said that, there are these through lines and these strange understandings and this movement of time and uh, and shifts. Sure. Yeah, I think it's just an American thing. I, I, I don't think other cultures are so obsessed with pigeonholing things into their little cubby holes and uh, trying to understand them that way. I think other, other beer cultures are much more open to fluidity and the, the uh, intentions of the brewer. You know, if you go to Belgium and there's a dark tripel, nobody's going to say it's not a tripel, you know? So I, I don't know. I'm trying to learn from that. Uh, you know, I'm trying to, uh, I've been a BJCP judge for, for, for 25, 30 years and I'm kind of just not into it anymore. I, I'm not aboard, uh, the whole, the whole game. That's fair enough. Now, um, in the long run for you, for Gabe, your wife and for Zebulon as a whole, uh, what's the future look like and what does uh, success look like for you? And uh, is there an end game or are you making this up every day as you go along? Yeah, I don't have any long-term plan. I'm, uh, you know, my, my business plan right from the beginning was to try to make the best beer that I can and try to make a living from it. And that was it. You know, there, there's no, there's no investors. There's no, you know, there's just there's really nothing other than that. It's just purely a labor of love, a passion project, and it seems to be working out now. And I hope it continues. But if it doesn't, I'm I'm totally fine with that. Um, it, you know, the average restaurant has like what three or four years turnaround. I don't see why breweries should be considered different i mean i if, if if zebulon went out of business i would very much consider opening up a brand new place very similar but with just a different concept <laughs> yeah you know sure, pe sure. people often people uh, always ask me like when are you going to expand when are you going to do this and i'm like if anything i'm going to open up two more breweries exactly like this but each one with its completely different purpose you know i would love to have you know two other breweries one doing you know traditional czech lagers and the other doing a hundred percent ipas you know, and, and I, I've got passions in both of those directions. And I, I would love just get, you know, young brewers to just head them up, just get one good brewer in each spot that are passionate about those styles 
and uh, just keep it just keep it tiny. I don't I don't understand the growth, 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 growth. It's just it seems toxic to me. And very anti-creative. I think you're better off opening up a, a – I mean you see that with restaurants owners. They do it all the time. They open up another restaurant doing something completely different. They don't try to get a second location for their successful restaurant. They use that to get another another spot so they can keep the creativity, creativity going. And I think that's what's lacking in a lot of modern brewing is creativity. Everybody's just following trends doing exactly what everybody else is doing and, you know, patting themselves on the back for doing a, another breakfast cereal IPA. That's just so tired at this point. That's just, you know, I try to, I, th I think there's a lot of room for breweries, even though it's so oversaturated. There was a brewer here in, in, in North Carolina. I think it was old Hickory that said, is like, there's not too many breweries. There's too many breweries doing the same thing. And I think that's still – even in today with, with a little town of Asheville with 80,000 people having 38 breweries or whatever, there's still room for somebody with some vision who wants to do their, their own thing. There's not any room for somebody wanting to open up another place doing IPAs and, uh, and stuff. It's just it's, – it's so oversaturated. Just stop. But if you've got a vision, do it. But make sure it's something different than what everybody else is doing. We don't need more of the same. That's an interesting point. And I think that um, you know, the idea of brewery as a mass market packaged product creator that has to have things in every segment for every kind of consumer, um, you know, that era, we've moved past that now. It's gone. You know. And it, there, but you're right. I think that uh, you know we look at European brewers as especially fantastic examples of this. When you know you and your Cantillon, you don't necessarily have to um, you know uh, spread yourself thin making other styles of oh, beer. Yeah, when Cantillon makes a hazy, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, they they joked about making a lambic IPA, and uh, <laughs> and they do love to to you know they do have a sense of humor about that. Thankfully. Uh, you know, but I think it's same kind of thing with lager makers now. You know, we're seeing this kind of resurgence of lager brewers in the United States, which is also an exciting and interesting thing that those beers exist and that you have focused brewers that are only making that. And that, uh, you know, for me, that's not the only beer that I'm going to drink, but it is. I would much rather, if I want to drink a lager, which I do multiple times per week, um, I'd certainly seek one out from a brewer who was so passionate and dedicated to doing that at the height of the of their own capability versus finding a brewery that just happened to make a lager because there might be some commercial space for it. Um, you know, there is I am excited that consumers can also start to appreciate and taste that level of passion if from the brewers themselves in, in what they're making. Oh yeah. I mean, if, if I have, um, people that I look up to at this point, brewer wise, um, it's, it's people like Bierstadt and Notch and, uh, you know, uh, dovetail in Chicago, just, just focusing on beautiful loggers, just focusing on detail, you know, making things just perfect. That, that's, that's what I'm attracted to. It might, might be my OCD personality or, or something, but I, just, I want perfection at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm so jaded. I've been in this since 1986, since most brewers have been alive. I just don't have time to waste with stuff that's not perfect. So, I, I, like years ago, I was watching The Iron Chef. You remember that show? Yeah. And they said – they had a quote that hit – home it, it was the connoisseur is by nature an unhappy person because they're searching for that which they so rarely find which is perfection and i was like that's me <laughs> <laughs> i i want perfection and i want it in my own beer and that's why i have to have trouble sometimes with my own beer because i just want everything to be perfect and I have trouble with a lot of other people's beers, too, because I just want it to be perfect. And the, anybody who is striving for perfection, I'm on board with. 
And those to me are the fellow brewers that I'm, you know, but if you're just doing stuff for, you know, just because it sells or because it's the latest trend, I'm just, I, you know, I'm not telling you don't do it. We're all, we're, we're, it's a tough time. We all need to do what we need to do. But I would love to see a little more creativity and uh, just people following their own path rather than chasing trends. It's just it's kind of sad. And it's, it's a race to the bottom at this point with, you know, the goofy ingredients and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, rather than getting uh, going off into that deep end, uh, let me just say that I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that with us, Mike. Um, Nearly 2,000 breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with G&D Chillers. RAR North Star Pills is a new base malt to set your compass by. Five Star Chemicals and Supplies, your leading provider of cleaning, sanitizing, and adjunct chemicals for breweries. Yakima Valley Hops is your hop source, whether you're brewing five gallons or five barrels. ABS Commercial is offering a free giveaway of the Keg Viking Keg Washer live on December 5th. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, we sure hope you go to beerandbrewing.com and click on the subscribe button to support what we do. Um, Mike, if people want to learn more about Zebulon, the beer you make, or come see you, uh, where do they find you all? Um, you can check out our website, zebulonbrewing.com. Um, we are on the outskirts of Asheville, North Carolina. We're like 10 minutes from downtown in a little uh, town called Weaverville, which is just a cute you know, one street, one main street town that's got a bunch of pottery and fun little restaurants. And it's a nice getaway from uh, from Asheville when you're tired of the uh, the Disneyland that is downtown. Um, Disneyland. And, uh, wow, that's uh... <laughs> now I grew up in Orlando, and... Florida, and so uh, I know Disneyland. Asheville is yeah. no Disneyland. <laughs> Or Disney oh, World. you'd be surprised now. I mean, you go downtown and it's 80, 90 percent tourists. I mean, whether or not that's Disneyland, that's sure. Know, sure. It's it's, uh, it's that is fantastic of... business. And that's why you can have 38 breweries in Asheville uh, surviving on a population oh, of that size. For sure. Yeah. I mean, what was the old rule of thumb? Like you need 50,000 people per brewery to open up a, a pub or something. That was back in the 90s. But uh you know, a town of Asheville without any tourism would probably be three breweries. Yeah. That would be yeah. a, a, lit, a re reasonable. We've gotten number. it down. I've, I've looked at it, uh, corollaries in Belgium and Germany, and uh, I think you can get down to about 12, 10 to 12, um, you know, in those countries. And maybe 16. One brewery per 10 to 12. Yeah, I think 000. 12 is kind of the low now. And, you know, in some place in the U.S., we're now at like one brewery per eight or 9,000 people. And that starts to sound pretty dangerous. But uh, um, anyway, that's another conversation for another time. I mean, I, I usually dissuade people from trying to open up a brewery in this overcrowded, oversaturated market. But if you're still in, a, in an area that doesn't have another brewery, within you know 30 minute drive i think it's still legitimate i just i think there's too many people packing in breweries where there's already too many already well now you just opened it up for me my opinion on this is exactly the same as yours there's plenty of opportunity for new breweries in this country right now there are plenty of underserved markets underserved communities um you know communities that are not uh, engaged with craft beer and there is a lot of space for uh you know potential growth through those through entrepreneurs in the breweries and passionate brewers in the brewing space that understand those communities and are interested in serving those communities and being connected to those communities. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity for those that want to have a cool lifestyle living out here in the Colorado mountains so they can go snowboard and mountain bike and just have a brewery to go along with it because that ship has sailed. Um, you know, you gotta grow weed too. Yeah, yeah right. Um, but throughout much of the South, for example, I mean, there are there is a very low saturation level of breweries, and there's a very large population of folks that could be engaged with this. And um, you know, there's this delta between where people who are passionate craft brewers want to live and where there is demand, you know, and uh, space in the market for those businesses to exist. And I think that. Over the next number of years, we will kind of watch some of those things come together a little bit more. And uh, and I think you're right. There's there's still some potential out there for new breweries. Yeah, I agree. And um, I, uh, you know, to all my fellow brewers out there, you know, just hang tough. It's going to be a, 
you know, we got another six months to a year to get through this, but it'll it'll end up being all right in the end, I hope. Well, cheers, Mike. Thanks for talking with me about brewing historical styles and uh, general trends in the industry and uh, and everything else. I really appreciate your viewpoints. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, cheers. Pleasure talking to you, brother. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.